We're live now. So one, I want to welcome everyone. Thank you all for spending time with us today. And what I think is going to be a fairly informative um, topic, um, a set of topics around cloud security experiences and how to grow, build, and scale in the cloud. Um, I'm happy to actually join you all to help kick off today. My name is Corey Thomas. I am the chairman and CEO of Rapid7. And with me today is Brian Johnson, who is our VP and executive in charge of both our cloud um, practices and technologies at Rapid7, as well as the founder of Divi Cloud. Brian, so great to actually chat with you this morning with everyone here today. Hey, thanks very much for having me. It's nice to have all of you guys here. Thank you guys for taking the morning and, and spending it with us all day and talking about cloud security and the challenges in front of us. Super excited. So for those of you who may not have sort of the full context, Rapid7 acquired Divi Cloud and the talented team uh, that Brian had assembled earlier this year uh, in the summer time frame. And the reason we acquired it was fairly straightforward and fairly simple is that we had a massive demand from our customers who are just struggling about the pace of cloud transformation, how to get their arms around it, and frankly, the new relationships that were emerging around the cloud about like who's responsible for what, how do we actually manage this, what's the responsibility of the DevOps team versus the security team, what are the new security structures and strategies, and, and we decided that we could not wait to actually slowly build it out. We need to go actually find some of the best thought leaders in the space and Brian and his team joined. And so Brian, I'd love just to start off the topic by the thing that was for me the catalyst about why you and I had started conversations earlier is that when we talked to lots of our customers, there was lots of things that we know about securities, but lots of things that were just fundamentally different in the cloud and people were struggling to get their arms around it. Can you just start off talking about your perspective about what makes cloud security different and hard? Yeah, look, I think what's interesting about cloud security is that uh, certainly when Chris and I started years and years ago from Electronic Arts, we actually began our journey with the idea that this was a technology problem. Mm -hmm. And I think what we recognized over a couple of years of sort of trying to make it start a company and figure it all out was that this was so much more than that. Cloud security and cloud in general is a business transformation problem. Cloud security is a part of that, but first you take a step back and say, well, this is actually a business transformation that we're going through. People are touching cloud and infrastructure who didn't use to touch infrastructure, say engineers directly accessing it. We had a lot more ephemeral resources, so things are changing a lot faster, and we just had a lot more stuff we were trying to manage in cloud than what we're used to. I mean, data centers had sort of a finite, there are four walls, right? Four walls and ceiling, of a floor, you only had so much room you could use. So, the, but in cloud, it's just infinite. Uh, at least seeming seem to us anyways. So, you know, I think that sort of scale where it changed and where people just makes it really challenging. And I think that second part of sort of going through the realization this is a business transformation, that is a realization people have to go through. And I think generally speaking, that's what makes it so challenging. So is it, you talk about the realization. Can you give, you know, I think that oftentimes we talk about these things as if they were sort of like a, a straight shot. Um, and rarely is sort of like any type of success a straight shot as a learning journey. Talk a little bit about on the journey you've been on, what are some of the areas that you thought were gonna be the right strategies in cloud? Where were you right, where were you wrong? But like, what was that learning journey like? And sort of like, that'll actually take us to sort of like, what do you think about the outlook going forward? But take us on the journey about sort of like, what are some of the bets you made that actually turned out to be a little bit off than what you expected? Well, I think the really good news for this particular question is that I have a lot of things I learned that were wrong. <laughs> uh, a lot of mistakes are made along the way, but I think a couple of the uh, sort of the big one that I'll hone in on was that, you know, going back to that rate of change thing, we, we thought maybe if we just, when we first started this process and as we worked with the industry, our original thought was that reporting is really what was missing. It was sort of like a cloud-based reporting. What, mm -hmm. What's going on in your world? And that came from a place where when we were running ops, Chris and I, we we need reports to know where everything was, we need visibility, and we thought that was all we would need, visibility and some reporting. As we moved into the, the sort of motion of trying to help our customers solve their problems, we realized that reporting and visibility just wasn't enough. You need to have automation. And that goes back to the rate of change. Things are just changing so fast that just getting visibility into it wasn't enough. You need to actually correct the issues in real time. Otherwise, you don't have a laundry list of a thousand things to do and you'd solve you know, five of them and you go, oh, here's a new thousand, right? Like, so it would just is constantly changing problem. H have you guys seen that in inside of Rapid7 and before we joined? I mean, is it something you guys have seen in the market as well? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's an interesting topic. We were thinking about it. My observation was I was going out spending lots of time with our customers that were going through a bunch of different transformations, 
But eventually, one theme actually stood out more and time again is that security for all the smarts and for all the technology we have available was not moving at the same pace of some of the IT changes and transformation. And so we started to actually use this language about like this gap, and we call, started to call it the security achievement gap. But it really was, what's the pace that security is actually automated, got a handle on things? It's not control. It's just what's the pace that we can actually manage security versus the pace of the environment's evolution. And, and, and that gap was something that many of our customers at every single size and scale in the industry were actually struggling with. Um, because you know we the theme the theme I heard again and again it's funny you talked about technology is not the always the problem is the theme I heard it time and time again was we are not keeping up and this was some of the smartest most sophisticated people um, you know like in enterprises that spoke at conferences and they were all struggling with this notion of keeping up and and so that's to me one of the things that sort of like we like okay we got to solve that pace like what's the pace that security moves. Now, you know, when we think about this, you, you've talked about automation a little bit. I think this is a theme that too, but I would love to just take a minute to actually sort of like hone in. What do you see right now when you look at, um, you have a range of customers. This is the thing that I appreciate it. You have some very, very mature customers and some very, very sophisticated customers. What are the attributes that you're seeing that makes someone successful when you think about what it takes to manage an environment well from a cloud perspective? And then how do you actually think about that translates to like what you should actually, um, what what you should actually sort of like focus on in terms of what are the hard problems to solve? Yeah, so I think when we think about cloud, and we certainly learned this, um, you know, so I had to keep going back to sort of the days at EA, although making video games was a lot of fun. The, the, you know, one of the things we saw then that I think plays out true now is that there's really two problems you're trying to solve. And, and one of them is you need to create, you know, focus of all of us in security. How do I create an environment that's secure and well-governed and I get visibility and all those different things. And so you've got to be able to deal with that in, in, in your world. But there's a second part of this equation that's new. And that second part is how do I educate the broader population? So if I've got, you know, even if I have 20 engineers or 5,000 engineers, it really doesn't matter if they're touching cloud on a regular basis, they're deploying servers and Lambda methods and, and you know, RDS databases and S3 buckets, they don't necessarily, or they didn't necessarily come with an instruction book about what is secure and what is not. There's no manual out there they can go use and, and they probably wouldn't read it even if there was. Uh, so, the, so you have to educate them along the way by taking your real-time op opportunities to engage them when they make a mistake or when they just don't understand the implications of something they've done, which is more often than not what you're dealing with. You know, someone might, open up, say, uh, a port, like maybe port 22, or maybe they open an S3 bucket up to the world, and they're just thinking, well, it, it'll just it's just for a second. It's just, just long enough for me to do something, and then they forget about it. Well, I think one of the other areas that we have to do as part of educating uh, the broader population is not only do we need to deal with the security issues, but we need to understand the scale of the attacker. It, it, there is a tremendous number of people out there who are just sitting around spending their entire time trying to find ways into your world and they're using the same resources that you guys have, that we have. They have infinite resources in the cloud they can use to scan your facility, to find open S3 buckets, to find you know, ports open where they shouldn't be. They have a, basically an infinite number of, amount of resources. So helping the engineering team understand that when they make a change that has an impact, they need to understand the impact of that change and they also need to understand the scale of which it's up against, that making a change, even if it's for a small amount of time, if it's against policy, could have adverse effects. And so the education of this is probably the most important thing, you know, right next to making sure you have automation that's enforcing policy in real time. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because it seems like you're actually talking about two things that are in tension. So you use two words, education, which invokes to me this consultative process um, that in some ways acknowledges that security teams may not have complete control. Um, but then you talked about automation and scale. Um, would you actually think about sort of being programmatized at scale? How, how do you how do you actually see this playing out? Because um, oftentimes I think that people are trying to figure out what's the role and who has control and who makes those decisions, and that is an education process and a and an alignment process, frankly. But if we're going to scale and sort of keep the pace with the way the technology is moving, then that does require sort of like lots of automation, lots of engineering to be designed into the security process. How are you seeing teams rationalize these tensions there? 
Yeah, look, it's, it's a it's a great it's a great question because there is this natural thing, especially in, in security, where we we as security we were always sort of the gatekeepers along with IT. And traditionally, if you wanted a server, you would submit a ticket and we'd go provision a server. You know, six months later, and that was part of the problem, right? Is it was just taking too long, and so there there's always been a natural tension between engineering and IT and engineering and security, and that tension is driven by speed. Right, your your engineering teams are saying you're going. Well, look, I need to get access to cloud because I've got a deadline to get this software launched, and our competitors are moving faster, and so on and so forth. Then it becomes this challenge of, hey, look, I appreciate your security needs, and I appreciate your sort of operations and processes, but you don't understand my problem. My problem is my competition is out there, and right now it's really stiff competition, and they're getting their features out quicker, and they're learning faster. So get out of my way, right? That was the tension that was there originally. And now we've moved into this sort of new tension where the that's what ha- was exactly what has happened. They have gone and uh, you know, engineering teams and product teams have gone and adopted cloud directly. And now security and IT have to figure out how to play a slightly different role. And that role is no longer a gatekeeper. It's more like a referee if there's anything close to it, right? It's sort of watching sort of what's happening identifying issues and using automation to remediate those issues. But there comes this interesting part of that now, this new tension, which is how do I automate problems in my environment without upsetting the entire engineering organization because I accidentally shut the wrong server down? Or how do we do this? And part of that, I think what we found is it's about being as real time as possible. Uh, we we actually learned this really early on at, with Thomas Martin, who, who hopefully everyone saw the opening video and we'll see later later in the conference. Through Ed General Electric, we right. saw this, uh, This if we went automated something too long after it happened, either it would have adverse effects because then software may be deployed to the server by that point, or nobody cared because the engineer spin, you know, spun the server up or the RDS instance or the S3 bucket for a short period of time and left it alone. You have to do it sort of in real time so you get that feedback loop. And, and what we found in doing that is if an engineering team or marketing team does something sort of against policy and it's remediated immediately, and education material comes with that, whether it be in the form of a Slack message or an automated Slack message, an automated email, or even placing a tag on the asset, you actually do get into this, a, a really interesting um, dynamic behind being able to solve the problem in real time, train in real time, educate them in real time, and now they understand what's going on and they don't get upset about it. And then as we continue to do this, we're gonna shift left and continue to shift left into the build pipeline. And I think that part is really interesting as well in ways to remediate some of that tension that's natural between engineering teams and, and security. So before we shift, before we talk about shifting left, can you just give us a landscape of what you're seeing right now in terms of what are the, you know, what does it sit in terms of the roles and responsibilities? Um, and, and how is that shaking out? I mean, I would tell you the number one question that I get um, from two different angles. I get questions from, I would say, CIOs and CEOs who are always sort of like, what are you seeing about like how people are organizing these efforts now? Because they're they're all thinking about sort of like reorganizing their teams. And so that's the number one question about like, what does the org chart look in XYZ company and something like uh, something else like that? And then from security teams is I get the questions about like, well, what are you seeing in terms of sort of like what I can actually control versus not just give me a feel of what you're actually seeing from sort of like for healthy organizations, the roles, responsibilities, a lot. I know it's going to be bespoke, but just give our audience a flavor for sort of like what you're seeing that actually works out there. Brian, you got to unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm muted because I was trying it to. Was very it. elegant. I know what you were saying was elegant. But... Oh, it's incredibly elegant, and, and it would have only been drowned out by this massively loud keyboard I have. Um, so the you know I think one of the things that that we see being very successful is that, and this goes back to a little bit of the skill gap we're seeing in the industry, as you have a lot of traditional IT and ops resources that haven't necessarily learned cloud yet, and so what we're seeing in these organizations building what we sometimes referred to as cloud center of excellence or some along those lines, that these centralized teams or distributed teams who are focused on cloud and cloud security as a part of what they do, but it's their prime, you know, the primary focus of that team is to focus on cloud security. The reason that's important is because it does require sort of some new motions. You know, having a having a run book that you give to a NOC or a SOC to be able to remediate cloud issues in real time it just doesn't scale. And that's sort of the way we did things. And so you have to think about the problem in a whole new way. 
not to say the SOC is incredibly valuable, it is in dealing with threats, but you also have to have a team that's focused on how do we remediate these issues? How do we deal with them from a cloud perspective? And, and that team needs to be focused on that. So we find allowing the organization to sort of, you know, norm and storm around a particular team that focuses on cloud security, cloud center of excellence has been incredibly important. And, and just as a quick pause, Corey, we're getting some great questions here in the, in the Q&A. So in fact, we're going to actually, if you can finish this one, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about shifting left because you teased that out earlier. So I know yeah. people are waiting to hear that. And then I'm actually going to jump to it. And I'll say right now that if you actually have questions, please drop them in the Q&A section uh, and we'll actually start taking some questions and I'll intersperse it with my questions. You know, the, the, the shifting left thing is really fascinating. There'll be another session uh, later in the conference where I'll be talking with, um, with gentlemen about this particular topic. Um, and it is around what does shift left mean for security? And I think my take on this, and it's an opinionated one, just to be clear, is, is that shift left is, you know, for security, it's not about providing, you know, moving all of security into the engineering hands where they own all security. Mm-hmm. That, that is, you know, probably in a reasonable expectation. You can look, no, you know, if you want to understand sort of why that might be unreasonable, look at the complexity of identity access management in cloud. And then ask engineers, do you, do you really want to learn all the complexities around IAM to do your job? And the answer is no, they just want to be able to get access to the things they need so they can get their product out. Going back to the earlier statement around, hey, I've got to get out in the market, I've got to learn from my customers. So there are some, you know, shifting left is really more about bringing the security team closer to the engineering team and align behind priorities and goals. And, and not so much about, hey, I'm just going to give all the responsibility to the engineering team and it's their responsibility to make sure everything is secure. Sure, they need to be doing some of that. They need to be doing some of the things around, um, you know, doing container scanning. They need to be doing some of those elements as part of their build pipeline. But they also need to integrating into security tools as a part of their build pipeline. And those security tools can sometimes be owned by, say, a cloud center of excellence. For example, if you're using something like a Terraform, you should be leveraging something like a CI/CD pipeline scanning mechanism, where before a Terraform template gets deployed, a central security tool should be looking at that Terraform template applying it as a sort of what is this going to look like in real world scenario and making sure the same policies that are being used to automate and govern your infrastructure are being applied to that Terraform template before it gets deployed. And that's about shifting left that I think is is maybe a misnomer. It's not about saying, look, engineering team, you're on your own. It's about bringing the tools and resources closer to the engineering team and integrate into their processes. So I think we have a couple questions that came up around shifting left and I'll go back to some of the earlier questions. But the first one I think you just hit on uh, which is interesting. Where do companies go next after they ship left and implement near time automation? Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think part of the question there is so, like, okay, we shift left, but then really, what does that actually give us and how do we think about it? And then, what does it mean to actually do sort of, I think you use real time, they use near time here, but like, what does that actually mean as you actually go forward? Yeah, look, I think that's a good question. You know, as we think about what does it mean to automate, you know, the shift left mechanism? I think there's two parts of that. One, we're going to try and get to a point as an industry where we're automatically updating and changing Terraform templates in a Git repository somewhere as a re- in reaction or response to an issue that happens during CI/CD. But I think also we have to be understanding of what developers are trying to do. They're learning just like we are as security teams. Like Amazon releases, I don't know how many new services every year that we have to sort of track and understand. Developers are learning that at the same time we are, right? So we have to be a little bit forgiving in what they're doing and provide them environments where they can experiment. Their development environments, their sandbox environments. And in those environments, what you may want to do in shifting left is, is your remediation in that case is more just warning them about the parts of their deployment that are going to have problems when they try to go production. Hey, this service is new. We don't know anything about it. So this might be a challenge. Or, hey, the way you're using this particular service, when you move that in production, that's not going to work. Giving them that sort of alerting and guiding them along the process. And then when you get to that production environment, you can fail the build. Hey, look, this we told you three environments ago this wasn't going to work. It's not going to work here. What are you trying to accomplish? And that's when security can sort of engage on a personal level and say, let us help you solve your goal. What is it you're trying to do? And that goes back to that consultative sort of approach to it. But it's about being with them every step of the way. And then hopefully we will get to a stage as we move forward where we can remediate the Terraform template, we can remediate the CloudFormation template in real time in the Git repository. But even then, that's only going to account, you know, sort of accommodate maybe 40 or 50 percent of the issues you're going to, have to be struggling with. You still have to have that human engagement. You still have to bring that consultative touch to it. And you still need to work with them in a teaming way to help them achieve their goals. 
So, I, you know, one of the things you just pointed out is the fact that sort of Amazon and others are constantly introducing cloud services. And one of the questions here, and I know we're not talking about roadmap in this particular session, but it says the shift left conversation is an interesting one. I would love to hear the future roadmap from Divi Cloud Rapid7 on container and serviceless protections. And I think part of it is just trying to get a sense about like, how do you think about um, leveraging technology to actually help people keep up with all of these changes that are actually happening in the environment? Yeah, so certainly, you know, for, for cloud security, and we, I'm, I'm not above peddling our wares. We, yeah. you know, as, as a cloud security practice here at Rapid7, one of the things we are focusing on is, as you mentioned, helping organizations close that security gap and achieving velocity and speed with their security program. And so when we look at things like shift left, some of the things we want to be able to do is, is we want to eliminate false positives and eliminate noise. That's a big part of that equation. So if we shift left and start warning or changing issues inside of a Terraform template, we better be really certain that the issue we're talking about is problematic. Because if mm -hmm. we just start throwing up sort of red flags, people will start ignoring them, right? It's just common practice. We're humans. We will feel like it's getting in the way and we'll move around it. So one of the pieces of technology we've worked really hard on on the shift left piece of the equation has been, hey, how do we tell you that when you're about to submit a Terraform template, we want to look at what you're about to build and not just tell you what's wrong with that, but there's a bunch of resources that you're dependent on, security groups, uh, identity access management roles that may exist prior that you're going to leverage as a part of your deployment, all these different things. We need to check those things in context of what you're about to build and tell you that, hey, while your template is okay, where you're about to place it and how you're about to place it and the resources you're about to use aren't okay. And so that will put your application into sort of a non-compliant world. The other, the other thing, and just real quick on the identity side, we have to do all the things we're talking about here, about just traditional infrastructure, which is just servers, Lambda, LGS. We do all this for IAM as well, because IAM is an incredibly complex environment, even way more so than traditional infrastructure. And we think that that's going to be a big part of this equation as well. Yeah, and you actually just hit on one of the recent questions that came in, which is really about um, it's not just providing code level feedback and pass fail information. How do you actually solve the problem? The way that I think about it is how do you actually provide context? Because um, I think one of the challenges you actually get is when you actually give people feedback that actually says this failed and this didn't work and there's no context in there, um, then that actually creates additional friction uh, between the security teams and some of the development teams. And so it sounds like your, your, your take is that you can't just actually give the feedback. You have to actually say, this is specifically what's wrong and here's how you actually don't have it again. Yeah, it's, and, and it's gotta be uh, contextually aware, right? If I'm sort of deploying an application into my crown jewels environment, that's gonna have a different set of contextual information about why you can't, can't do certain things. And you know, look, if, if we wanna help the engineering teams uh, sort of come to speed and security and help them get there faster, Part of that is providing that context. You're about to deploy into an environment that's got crown jewels, PCI information in it. No, you can't have an S3 bucket open to the world in that environment, right? Like these are the things we have to do as a part of the education process. And then I do think there's sort of making sure we feel like we talk a lot about shift left. I do want to take a moment to focus on identity because it is, look, just, just to say a lot, I think that infrastructure is challenging. Man, identity is hard. I mean, it is. There is a there's so many different ways you can change and tweak identity. Um, and this is going to be an area that's going to be difficult to shift left because it's so complex. So, Brian, can you just take a step back? Because um, I, I think that, you know, when lots of people think about it, I would say that very few customers, um, you have to get to a certain size and scale before you actually realize the identity problem. Yeah. Um, and so what we see is sort of like, our largest, most sophisticated problems, this is the new frontier. But we may have some people uh, who are early in the journey. Why is identity such a challenge once you actually sort of like achieve, you get everything working, you're going, you get the scale. Why does identity become a challenge? Look, um, I'll be first to admit that I did not fully recognize the, the challenge or the, the, uh, the issues we were gonna face. Like, I looked at identity, so I looked at always identity in cloud. Yeah, it was complicated and weird, but I didn't fully understand that about until probably two years ago, the breadth that our customers were seeing in terms of the number of issues they were facing. And it, it, it's the problem is cloud-based identity really is the new perimeter. It's the new firewall. It's how we're going to gate who can do what in the cloud. And so when people first started looking at this problem, they thought about it in a more traditional sense. 
you know, what can Corey, uh, although I have no, I, I assume you have access to an Amazon account still. If not, we're going to talk about this. But They don't give me any privileges in South Africa. <laughs> I, yeah, Slack <laughs> just recently said that I'm not allowed to have anymore. But, the, <laughs> but you know, the, the, the thing is, is that it's not just about who can do what in the cloud. It's about what can do what in the cloud. And that's a whole different question because Lambda methods and servers and all sorts of different things can have their own set of permissions associated to it that provide them access to do things. And, and that's going to lead to a whole new set of challenges. A, a great classic example of this is the Capital One breach that occurred. Because it was one of the first times we saw in a high profile environment where you had a traditional exploit matched with an identity privilege escalation issue in cloud. And that all happened because on the cloud side from an IAM perspective, they had an overly permissive role. Well, we have customers that have 70, 80,000 roles in their environment. I mean, so to be able to go through that with like a fine tooth comb and try to figure out what's permissive and what's not permissive is just a really hard thing to do at speed and scale. And that's the other part of this. It's the scale and it's the ephemerality and speed in the environment it's moving in. You may go through all 70,000 roles in you know, a quarter, but by the time you loop all the way back around again, there's gonna be a whole new set of roles because there's new applications and new things that are happening. And so how do you tweak all these roles and make it so that not only users only have access to what they need when they need it in real time and, and near time to, to use the, the Q&A, but also how do you make sure that you don't have a server out there that if compromised provides access to way more than you needed it to or expected it to. And that's just so hard to do in cloud, in any cloud environment, but specifically AWS. Couple of tactical questions because we got some good specific questions there, and then I think we're gonna get ready to tee up the next section. So it says we're setting. Lucas said we're setting up an AWS perimeter using just AWS native services, no third-party firewall or IPS, except host-based IPS on EC2 instances. Is this pattern sustainable? Can you give them some advice? Man, I think you can also provide some leeway here. Which I can certainly talk to the cloud infrastructure uh, side of the equation, and that is that. Um, Look, everyone's got to go at their own pace to figure out how they sort of move in this world. And it just depends on what your needs are. There is no one size fits all solution to these problems. Um, what I can say is that as you move forward, the couple of things to keep in mind, you know, multi-cloud is not necessarily something that happens strategically. So it just happens sometimes. You wake up one day and you have engineers who are using Azure. And so you, one of the things we have to be thinking about as security professionals is, you can't show up and say, no, you can't use that because that goes back to the old mentality of the gatekeeper way, the way we used to do IT. And uh, my experience in this is they will go do it anyways. So you have to find a way to engage them and build policies and frameworks that use multi-cloud. So that, that's the first thing I would think about. The second thing I would think about is a lot of the tooling you will see inside of AWS and the cloud virus is amazing tooling. And you should leverage as much of it as you possibly can to accomplish your goals. What I will say is our customers do find that those they are, they are just that, they are tools, they are not strategies. So as you think about how you formulate your strategy moving forward, things like tag policy, what does that look like in your environment and how are you going to leverage it? What is your identity framework going to be and how are you going to make sure it's enforced? And how are you going to make sure you do those things across multiple environments, whether it be Kubernetes, which by the way is basically a cloud inside of a cloud. So how do we deal with that particular problem set? So those are the things I would be thinking, well, I can't possibly say that, hey, don't, you know, only Amazon native tools and that's going to be fine. But those are the challenges you should, I think you should be considering. Corey, I don't know if you have any additional. Yeah, questions. I also have a couple of thoughts and I, I know that I'm probably going to get booted off stage soon. But the, uh, so a couple of thoughts is one, I would say that it's always good to explore what's actually there. I think with many of the um, AWS or Azure tools, um, I think that they are actually good and serve a purpose in AWS specifically, you may and you will likely reach a complexity limit where dealing with a bunch of individual tools, especially um, as your environment grows, is actually going to be more inefficient than actually looking at solutions that are really optimized around management and scalability and actually allowing you to have the consistency and the control you need at scale. But that said, I think it's incredibly important for you to know what's out there. Um, many of our customers actually really start looking at tools outside of the environment as they actually start thinking about scale, because that's really where we actually focus on about like how do you actually simplify and rationalize the complexity of environments where like AWS, which are really honed for the developer and less so for the management and security experience. The other question that actually just came up is how do I actually move off-prem with a limited budget? And I'll just share one perspective is that the 
uh, some of the most successful things is not actually thinking about moving off-prem. It starts with the, all right, all new stuff that we actually do will actually happen in the cloud. So instead of migrating, just start with all new stuff is going to actually happen in the cloud. That gives people the experience on discrete services that were designed for that specific environment. Um, and then as you actually get some experience and you accumulate the experiences, then you can actually target where you think to move. I would say if you especially have a limited budget, I will be cautious about just lift and shift um, wholesale because I don't know if you're going to get the return that you look for there. There's so many great questions. I think we've hit lots of these as we actually went through, but I am cognizant that we're at time. And I think, Brian, we have another session coming up. You want to tee that one up? So, and, and, I, and I would uh, just to echo your comments there. Lift and shift can be incredibly expensive. When we moved into cloud originally, our thought was that we were doing it for cost savings. That isn't necessarily accurate. You're doing it for speed and innovation. So yeah. it, you know you you can save money in the cloud, but it's something you have to actively do. It's not just going to happen, right? So as you do that shift, I think it is something to consider. So yeah, we have an amazing. Uh, well, actually, before I announce the next session, Corey, I'd like to thank you very much for being a part of this today. And, thank and you so much for having me. Thanks. You know, I want to thank everyone that joined us today. I really appreciate you all joining, and I've enjoyed the discussion. So thank you. Yeah, excellent. So coming up our next session, super excited to announce uh, it's going to be Achieving Continuous Compliance in the Cloud. David Gerotny from Rapid7, who's going to be moderating a session between GenCode from AWS for Amazon Web Services and Wei Dong from CX Loyalty. So I'm super excited to welcome them to the, uh, I guess I can call this the stage, uh, stage or to my uh, office, as it were. So thank you guys very much for the time today. I'm going to hand it over to David Gerotny, and they're going to take it from here. Please hit me up on chat if you have any questions, uh, ping us. We're happy to, to chat one-on-one -on -one or however it might work.